Hi there, my name is David Miller and I'm a teaching pastor at Abernathy United Church in Abernathy, Texas. Glad to be with you this morning if you're watching it in the morning or you're watching uh, maybe later in the day or later in the week this um, sermon from Abernathy United and i um, grateful to spend this time with you. We're are still in our Bible reading plan. We're in the second half. We're actually in the book of John mainly this week. So I'm going to be sharing out of John 17 today. And as I do that, I just want to remind you that um, the online, the video portion of what we do in our services isn't a good substitute for being there in person because you miss out on the fellowship with the body. And then um, we also provide a different version online that's more like a devotion. So I just want to encourage you as you're able to return back to the body and let's all seek to prioritize being together in worship services and also in small group ministry, in our U groups and working in our ministry teams to serve the Lord as part of Abernath United. So I just wanna encourage you to keep moving forward, pressing on in your faith with endurance and perseverance until we're called to be face-to-face -face with the Lord. So John 17 verses 20 through 23, out of the ESV version this morning, says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Now, this is the night before Jesus was betrayed and was on his way as he knew it to the cross the disciples, the apostles, um, we have indication that they didn't understand that. But he's talking, um, just praying here to his father. And he prays at one point for himself. Then he prays for his disciples, his apostles, those who, the Jews who he was ministering to, who would eventually spread the gospel. Um, but then he changes the topic and praise for a new group. Notice that he says, not for these only, meaning the apostles, but for the ones who will hear from them. That would be you and I, who have heard from those original early disciples and apostles. Of course, the, the eventual apostle to the Gentiles ended up being Paul. Um, but you and I would hear as a consequence of them spreading the word and the early church movement. So really important that we realize that Jesus is praying for the unity of the body, which includes you and I. It includes his church, that he was praying that as believers, we would be united. And so it's uh, amazing to me that this is what Jesus, you wonder what his priorities were as he was getting ready to go to the cross to pay for the sins of all mankind, for all who would believe, isn't it something glorious um, that is really at stake for you and I in our public unity as Christians? That we are called to be a witness to Jesus, the one sent by God. And Jesus is praying that it would be the unity that binds us together, that would be the best testament to those around us and those that would see it. So, we need to realize that our diversity as Christians is glorious. And that means that Methodists, Baptists, Episcopalians, uh, Lutherans, uh, those who belong to the Church of Christ, anyone who believes in um, salvation by faith alone and in Christ alone, then those are our brothers and sisters for sure. And we should celebrate that diversity. And there's a wide range of worship practices and liturgical practices and all kinds of splashes of color and ethnicities and diversities and um, uh, processes and discipleship practices, and they enrich the whole body of Christ. 
they unite us all together as we can find in Revelation 7. But I want you to get what Jesus was praying for here and what his emphasis was. He's really praying and uh, based on understanding that it's our unity, our surprising solidarity. It's our heartfelt oneness, if you will. It's um, the shared beauty that we have together that would make it easier for non-believers to understand the power of Jesus and his love as the one sent by his Father. And we should notice carefully in the text that the primary way that people would understand that we're different, that we're followers of Christ, would be that they would see the treasure of Christ in our unity with one another as believers. It would be our love and our unity that they would look to to say, wow, they're just a different people. I want you to notice that Jesus uses the word so that uh, at least twice that his purpose in praying for unity would be that a non-believing world would look at us and see that we are the light of the world, not because of our own doing, but because of the work of Jesus Christ within you and I. So the Bible teaches clearly and emphatically that there is one body, there is one spirit, there's one God and Father over all in Ephesians 4. Yet we seem to struggle when there are differences in the body, which Christ tells us about, that there was all types of, of people and giftings, um, spiritual giftings and talents in the body, different preferences in the body. And so how do we, as the Bible say, bear with one another in love? So it's important for us to remember that our unity bears witness to the gospel and it's a direct outcome of living the gospel. That if you and I are living out God's word together, then non-believers and, and believers alike will see the unity in the body. And this is a place certainly where the enemy seeks to disrupt us and move us contrary to this based on our own, as the Bible says, warring passions with one another. Our own sinful passions is how the enemy seeks to disrupt the unity that is called for in the church and the larger body of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I just want to share with you quickly four points. And uh, one of these is a question, but do you and I really value unity? Do we desire unity and do we move towards it? So I just want you to contemplate how are you and I doing our part as it relates to creating unity and maintaining it at Abernathy United and beyond our own local church with other believers who are outside of our faith traditions or certainly outside of our direct community of faith. So four points. One is that there are several warnings against divisiveness in scripture. Remember Matthew 5, 23 and 24 where we are reminded that before we go and give a gift at the altar, that we are called to remember the brother who has a uh, something against you and we're to um, quickly leave our gift at the altar and then go make peace. And um, in that way, we are called to be reconciled first to our brother and sister and then come back and complete your gift at the altar. The, the word tells us that reconciling and making peace should be done even before we give to the church. This may be one of the most disobeyed verses of all time. How often does this happen in the American church, the church broadly, to where we have a hidden um, concern or hurt which we don't address, and then we end up um, just bearing it? not um, confronting it, not seeking reconciliation. So um, a couple of examples, and the Bible uses very strong words when warning us against being divisive in the body. Uh, Romans sixteen seventeen says, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them is what scripture said. How about this? Titus uh, 3, 10 and 11 says, 
as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So the Bible has very strong words for and warnings against us being devices. So really, if you look at it in context, Christ is saying that the way people would know that we are believers, that we're followers of Christ is by our unity. But so often we can get so bent and warped on our own preferences that we think what matters most is our own needs and our own desires and not Christ, not unity in the body, not unity with other believers. So from that perspective, we should realize that when we do that, we are in contrary to what God calls us to in Christ, the main purpose and way that people would know that we're followers of Christ, the main mechanism, if you will, that Jesus would call us to, to ensure that people would be pointed to the light and not to darkness. So this morning, how are you doing at making sure that you're not engaged in divisiveness, not spreading rumors, not um, moving forward and creating obstacles, not standing in the way of unity, but instead pursuing it. The second point, do we really want and desire unity? You see, whatever the controversy at the moment, whatever we have a tendency to war against others in the body, the broader body, whether it be at Abernathy United or whether it be with the uh, a people who are brothers and sisters in Christ who are another denomination or attend a, uh, another body is that you and I should be able to express our differences and concerns with such care that a reasonable non-believer would look at it and say, there's no bloodlust here. There's no desire to harm anyone else. There's sincerity of heart and even beauty in the way they approach even disagreement. Do you have disagreements that end in peace? Do you have disagreements where there's grace and uh, loving kindness and tenderness? Or is it about having our own way? Not Christ's way, but our way. So one of the things that you and I can gather from Scripture is that we need to uh, find a way to honestly make sure that we're not attaching ourselves to the name of Jesus if we're not willing to move forward in unity. We'd be better off just being honest that if our preferences are going to come first and we're going to operate in the flesh, then maybe we should realize that we wouldn't, shouldn't hold ourselves out as followers of Christ. That's how serious this is, is that we're not going to take unity seriously then we're not really taking our faith in our relationship with Christ very seriously. Remember, this is the, the thing, the thing that he prays for, unity among believers before he goes to the cross, before he is betrayed and moves towards his last days on this earth, before he is ultimately crucified and then resurrected, defeating death for all time. If we love Christ Let's join him in this heartfelt prayer that he prays for unity. And then let's do something about it. Let's go to that other believer that we have an issue with and then make the peace so that we too can operate in unity. The third point is that working in peace and unity requires patient discernment. It requires, as we see, that we are called many times in Scripture to discern how to move forward in healthy agreement and love with other believers. Jesus says the following, you will be hated for my name's sake. He says that in Luke 21, 17. Jude instructs us to contend for the faith against false teachers in Jude 3. Jesus rebuked sinful religious leaders in Matthew 23. And Paul rebuked Peter in Galatians 2. See, we are called not just to move forward and always be in agreement. You see, sometimes conflict 
shouldn't be avoided. That is essential. So the question is, how do we have conflict in a way that provides unity in the body? The primary doctrine even of salvation that is in Christ alone and by faith alone is worthy of contention. It's worthy of conflict. When we come across to believers who have works intertwined with their belief and understanding of salvation and not, not a consequence of our salvation, but part of it, then that is a certainly a false teaching and we should contend for the faith. But even that, let me tell you, should be done in love. I'll tell you that I'm unwilling to partner publicly um, with those who don't believe in the primary doctrine that is salvation in grace alone and in Christ alone. But that also means that the, the engagement and disagreements should be done in love and separately um, for in a way that would provide embarrassment or be a bad testimony to our faith. But most of the conflicts you and I end up end up in are not that clear cut. They're filled with nuance and they're difficult to navigate. And it's difficult because there's a mix of valid concerns and misunderstandings and fears. James calls these sinful warring passions in James 4, 1. It's when you and I operate in jealousy or self-ambition or prideful unwillingness to admit fault. You see this so often in the church, in every church, to where there's a believer or a multitude of believers who are engaging based on their own preferences and can be quick to demand their own way. We see this often, but the question is, how do you move forward? I was in a meeting this past week and saw beautiful humility and guarding of our words in a way that would provide unity. You see, so often you and I have to be wise in discerning the nature and the chemistry of a conflict and how much of an agreement of the mix requires discernment or patience or endurance or forbearance or wisdom, all in the role and desire to create unity. I want you to think about this. It's our, um, what is required here is our rigorous self-disciplined commitment to being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The Greek word for pursuing peace really points to the word striving for peace. You see, it's more like requires pressing in, doggedly pursuing it, not giving up when there is conflict, but instead pursuing peace and reconciliation when there is disagreement, which is needed many times as followers of Christ. Finally, the fourth point is that we're called to pursue peace to death. So you may be wondering, what does that mean? How do we strive for peace? Well, think about who our example is. It is Jesus, the Prince of Peace, as he's called in Isaiah 9. And the Prince of Peace said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. He says that in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, so that they will be called the sons of God. Now, I want you to get, to get this. He's not saying peacekeepers. He's not saying preserve artificial peace. Be a doormat. That's not what he's saying. Sometimes the only way to full peace is to engage in healthy conflict. So how do we do that as followers of Christ? How do we engage in that conflict? And what does it mean to pursue peace to death? And how should that look in our lives? I would argue at the very least, it means to put to death what is earthly in us. Colossians 3, 5 says, and that means to love one another with brotherly affection. We can see that in Romans. We can also see this call to outdo one another in showing honor. It means to bless those who persecute you and to live in harmony with one another. It looks like our desire to strive for peace with everyone. And most of the time, 
most of our conflicts are avoidable. And so we should engage um, with caution until it's clear and we have confirmation that the conflict is biblical and it's unavoidable. We are called to create unity. We're called to sometimes rebuke and admonish one another. And there's no end to the call to make sure that you and I are pressing on to the call in Christ Jesus and doing that with passion and conviction. And sometimes that requires that we engage in each other's lives in a way that's uncomfortable. But we're mainly required to do that in love and in peace, seeking unity and reconciliation. So you and I are called to do that together. How are you doing in moving towards unity in the body? Not just Abernathy United, but the broader body in Abernathy and in all the world. Today, I hope that you um, will search your heart to see how are you engaging in unity. And if you don't know Christ, I pray that you will find him today, that you will commit your life to him in a personal relationship with him as our Lord and Savior. If you'd like to pray a prayer to accept him as your Lord and Savior, commit your life to him by repenting, which means to, to turn the other way, to, to declare him as your Lord and Savior, realizing that he died on the cross and rose again that third day, defeating death for all time, for all those who believe. If you wanna do that, you can contact me, 806-438-0089. I'd love to pray with you. In the meantime, I pray that you and I move forward in unity to walk together in peace as peacemakers, not just peacekeepers. No artificial unity, but real unity grounded in love. Not the love that you and I can manufacture on our own, but only provided through the Spirit. I pray that you and I will do that this week. Until I see you next time, I pray you walk in the joy and peace that's only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ.